I think the first six months of this year and the better part of last year has done a lot to remind people that gold is a global asset. And don't just get fixated on one factor when you're trying to understand what's going to drive the price. Because for the first half of the year, what we've seen is an increased level of demand from central bank buying, which we've known that's been playing out for 14 years and record levels for 22 and 23. Um, but it's continuing, and it's continuing for the right kinds of reasons, not just political or geopolitical risks. Special coverage from the Gould Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida, is brought to you by Contango Ore, developing Alaska's next gold mines. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, here from the floor of the Rule Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. My name is Kai Hoffman, I'm the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host for this conversation. And I'm really looking forward to this one, because again, it's a new first time guest on the channel. It's Joe Cavatoni, he's the market strategist over at the World Gold Council, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. It's like, I've met John Reed before, but we haven't had the pleasure yet. We haven't. So, really looking forward to this, and uh, thanks for making the time. John's a good, trusted, uh, a colleague of mine, and I'm really happy to be on the, uh, the program with you today. So thanks yeah, for Yeah, John was a guest, a keynote speaker at our uh, Deutsche Goldmesse, the German gold show in, uh, I think, a year and a half ago now. Right. Uh, in Frankfurt, Germany. So uh, I was really enjoyed the, com uh, the company there and, of course, his presentation. But uh, maybe we'll start, uh, you quickly introduce yourself. You know, sure. like uh, you're a market strategist at the World Gold That's Council. Right. Quickly, like, explain what that is, like what so, that title includes. So my role at the World Gold Council is focused on getting our message out getting people educated and understanding what the gold market's all about and simplifying it. I think a lot of people in the markets have a lot of strong opinions about gold, but many of them are incomplete or maybe one-sided. And I talked a little bit about that today when I presented, which is everyone's looking and fixated on rates as an example and missing the big trick that gold's a global asset. And that's our goal. Our goal is to get this information, our data and our insights, and our research into the hands of everyone that could possibly use it and give them the framework so that they can understand how to analyze gold and feel comfortable and trust it, and then basically make the consumption of it, whether it's in the form of jewelry, investment, or however they want to go about owning it. And that's it. That's what we focus on. Have you met Idris Elba? I have not met <laughs> Idris Elba, but I've seen the video, <laughs> I've promoted the yeah. video, and, and I'm wondering, you know, if I even have a shot at even getting his attention in a crowd. So I'm, I'm, I'm highly unlikely to even come close to him in a crowd. No, it's like, this is a good move. Like, I've seen some other marketing campaigns from the World Gold Council where I was like, oh, really? But then the, the videos, I think, are a really good series and really educational and actually really well done. I think that, that we would definitely say thank you because we're really proud of the work that we've done. But there's a purpose to the, to the no. entertainment value that comes along with the videos. And that's basically opening the eyes of the average person to what the market's really all about. It started off with the golden uh, videos that we did on gold uh, that basically were talking uh, about six or seven different use cases for gold. Mm -hmm. And then it led into the journey with Idris Elba. And I think it's actually, it's a, it's a, it's a storyline. It's a, an education line that's going to continue. So keep an eye on the space and fun things are happening there. John Reed and I are actually trying to look at it and look at how we use our podcast on earth mm -hmm. to model out how we talk to people in the market and get education going. But it serves a real important purpose. It's basically giving people insight into the market that they might not understand. It was really helpful. I watched it with my kids because my kids have no clue what I'm doing. That's right. All they know is like, hey, daddy's in mining. Daddy's somewhat involved with gold, but they don't really get it. And it's right? funny because the word you used, mining, may in many contexts be a dirty word for people. Yeah. And they might think about an old form of mining or mining where they see pictures from days gone by and not really have an appreciation for a lot of the good work that the mining companies are doing, the industry is doing, and the significance that mining plays when it comes to the future of energy transition or whatever the case may be. So it's good to give people the education. It's fun to do it. I thought, you know, I did a number of media spots around the release of the journey and uh, I just even though I knew the story, I thought it was really fun to relive the understanding that he, Levi Strauss made a lot of money <laughs> off the back yeah. of mining. So it wasn't it wasn't necessarily the gold. It was the picks and shovels and the blue jeans that made people rich. And I thought that was just fun to be reminded of that fact. Now, it's kind of interesting. I love these little tidbits like the San Francisco 49ers, the, N the NFL team is and named after the gold rush. That's like, right. I have to admit, like I didn't know for a long time that that was the case. That's right. right? So those little tidbits or those nuggets 
nuggets, you know, <laughs> are, are, are hidden like everywhere in plain sight. And there's so much mining history everywhere. There is. There is a lot of history and there's a lot of future with, that's going to come from it as well. And I think that actually, you know, some of the, 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 the features in the film are really worth people understanding and, and getting to have an appreciation for because it's not just, you know, promotion. It's actually looking at energy transition in markets that need energy transition and modernization of power sources and infrastructure. You know, it's, it's easy to sit in a market like the U.S. and simply say, oh, well, I'll just go solar. But how does that play out in an emerging market? How does that play out in a mine site that actually leads to a community getting a better use and, and source of energy that could be built around them at the expense of the mine? And actually, it's important to understand it. Because again, like I said, it's a privilege to be sitting in a market like the U.S. where we can, you know, click our heels and decide that we're going to do something different. No, no, yeah. absolutely. No, really, really good insights. As I said, like really enjoyed the video. But uh, let's talk gold. Let's sure. let's talk performance of gold. Um, let's let's recap maybe the first six months because we're sitting here. What is it? July eighth. So Q one, Q two are over. Yeah. Let, let's sum up uh, the first half of the year uh, a little bit. Uh, what, what have you seen? Like, what were some of the the drivers behind the recent move in gold? I think the first six months of this year and the better part of last year has done a lot to remind people that gold is a global asset. And don't just get fixated on one factor when you're trying to understand what's going to drive the price. Because for the first half of the year, what we've seen is an increased level of demand from central bank buying, which we've known that's been playing out for 14 years and record levels for 22 and 23. Um, but it's continuing and it's continuing for the right kinds of reasons, not just political or geopolitical risks. It's continuing because they're looking to diversify their portfolios and they need liquidity and they need that certainty in their reserve portfolios. But also the Eastern investor has emerged as the real price performing driver of the gold market year to date. And that means investors in China, investors in India, investors in the Asia Pacific, physical gold, financial instruments, all being taken up in a large scale way, all being offset by a lot of noise and a lot of attention to the 6% ETF market that you see in the US and in Europe. Lots of people fixated on that, but it's not driving the price right now. What's really driving the price? Eastern investors and central banks. And that's showing up in the demand numbers. Now, let's see how it plays out for the second half of the year. But the strength of those two consumers has actually done a lot to move the price of gold. Now, we had a spike in the price. That was probably a bit driven by speculation as well with the expectation of rate cuts. Lots to follow up on. I'm trying to figure out like how, how to go at this now because you, you mentioned a couple of things like sure. geopolitically I want to follow up on. East versus West, I think, is an interesting one. Sure. Um, you, you mentioned central bank buying has been ticking up to, to sort of bring reserves home, secure reserves on the balance sheet. Yeah. Have you seen a change since the weaponization of the Swiss, uh, SWIFT system, the banking system? Has, has that been a trigger or has that been going on or just an accelerator? Was that just, uh, you know? I think uh, it was just an accelerator of a dynamic that was already playing out. I think the bigger factor at play with central banks right now is how they're managing their portfolios as a sophisticated investor. Okay. And if you look at our annual central bank survey that we've just completed, we have the most number of central banks that have ever responded to it before, 70, and most, 80% of them are talking about, over 80%, I should say, are talking about the number one driver is a reliable source of a liquid asset that protects them in market volatility. They're concerned about inflation, they're concerned about homegrown inflation, and they're concerned about performance of other assets in their portfolios. Dollar-based, dollar-based assets, and that's what they're looking at. They're not necessarily just basing this decision just on geopolitical risks or the yeah. weaponization potential of the dollar. They're looking at bigger factors at play. I was going to say, maybe break that down, a geopolitical climate a little mm -hmm. bit uh, as well. Like, what are some of the, the answers, maybe, since you've done that survey? Is like, you, you mentioned de-dollarization to a degree. Like, you didn't say de-dollarization, but it sure sounded like it a bit. Oh. Like, worry, worry about a decline in the U.S. dollar, potentially. Inflation sort of fits into that as well. Sure. Like, what, do you, what do you see, like, when you break down the geopolitical climate there? So, what I think we would highlight would be a couple of different factors. The first is that there are a lot of central banks that are looking at dollar performance, dollar reliance, dollar dependency, as well as euro dependency. And they're signaling over the next five years that they will reduce their dependency on that. So, that's the first thing that I'd say. The second thing is policies are going to basically develop in a way that are actually going to raise or cause concerns around 
the tensions between different nations. So will that be a geopolitical risk or will that be a weaponization? Probably not. But it's definitely on the mind of central banks. But it's probably third or so on the list of things that are playing into their decision to continue to hold gold or increase their overall performance or, or allocation to gold. But I'd say to you, what really is at the heart of that central bank buying is the financial analysis of how they're going to manage their risk in their portfolio. Now, you are. We had this news that made the market about. It sounds how, so sensible what you're saying. <laughs> well, it, and it is actually. It's actually quite encouraging yeah. to see that the data and the and the research and the feedback we're getting is in line with what our expectation is, which is basically people looking at diversification and the benefits that come along with it. Again, there are political factors at play. There are geopolitical factors at play, and and that is weighing in. But it's not the sole reason. I was going to say it's like because central bank buying mostly happens in the east. Not the West. In emerging right? markets is what Or, I'd say. Yeah. So I'd say to you that the largest component of buying has been done by the emerging market central banks, mm -hmm. and less so by the developed, developed market mm -hmm. central banks. So Singapore is probably the standout market of where no. you've seen flows of gold into the market. Interesting. Um, another thing you mentioned is ETF buying. And, uh, Or selling. Or selling. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's an interesting one, because I'm trying to figure out like what's holding gold up right now. Like we've heard that China didn't buy anything in May, all right. So, but then we've seen like of watching. Uh, I was in New York, I think, in mid-May for for a conference. I was attending uh, the SME conference, and uh, I think it was Monday morning. All I heard was gold and copper and ETF buying. There was even a segment right. where five hundred million dollars, uh, I think, for the previous week went into the uh, GLD, sure. the gold ETF. Right? Um, has that been propping up uh, the go the gold price, like so sort of putting a floor under it? It's actually been an interesting dynamic because on its own. The ETF market on a global scale to date, through today, is out about 110 tons of gold. So in the grand scheme of things, that's not a lot when you think about where we were in terms of the overall consumption of gold over the course of an annual basis. You know, that could very easily be set off, offset, I should say, by one or two quarters of coin and bar demand in the U.S. market, which has seen 35, you know, 38 tons per quarter first quarter and third quarter of 2023. So overall, what you're seeing is different dynamics in different parts of the ETF market. The Asian market has seen $3 billion worth of inflows year to date. Europe and the US has seen outflows of about $4.5 billion each. And where that's actually changing is when the expectation for the rate cut or the move on the part of the policymakers to lower the cost of, of, of the, the, lower the rates, I should say, no. Uh, ultimately deal with real rate environment, you're going to see the central bank, or sorry, I should say, you're going to see the institutional investor gravitate back because the opportunity cost of holding something else versus gold is going to lower. And that's actually what we're waiting for and what we're seeing. You know, there's been a 25 basis point ECB cut in the last month in Europe. And actually what we've seen out of European ETF flows is about $2 billion in really? over the last yeah. two months. So the investors are speaking to us. They're saying, hey, look, when I see these policy changes at the rate level, I'm going to act. That plus politics in Europe, that's moving people to the asset. Right now, what you've seen is probably a curtailing of all the outflows that you see in the U.S. market. Why? Because we're as close as we've ever been to this illustrious rate cut that's supposed to come from the Fed. It's been so it's to always tomorrow. Through. It's always yeah. tomorrow. It's always mañana. But, uh. <laughs> exactly. But, but look, people are waiting and the expectation is there that it's not feasible for rates to continue to rise and, and the Fed to continue to sustain things at these high levels. So it's a question of when. How, That'll how bring much, investors back. How much are these rate cuts already priced in into the current uh, gold price? Well, I, I think that's actually playing into what you're seeing in terms of the volatility in the gold price. So you'll see a 3% up, a 3% down move in the price on every given week. And it usually tends to come on the back of some signal, some message that some Fed president speaking, probably or, or yeah. someone on the board is talking. <laughs> and, and, and actually, we're getting close to a decision point. And actually, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing it priced in there. But I ultimately think that the investor hasn't come back in large scale because at this stage, would you be more comfortable with a 5% cash flow on a cash deposit right now at a money fund? Or would you be waiting to see where rates are going to go and then move back to the gold market? I think the latter is the case. They'll wait for the rate market move. No. How do you weigh recession risks uh, when, it, when it comes to that? When you look forward, like hard landing, soft landing, depending on the, uh, the I scenario, think, I guess. But how does that weigh on the gold price, like positively, negatively, I'm curious. I think if we see a recession develop, and that's a very realistic possibility that's still on the table, then that's going to be an environment that's going to be strong for gold. I think ultimately risk assets will suffer significantly. And what you can see out of seven of the last nine recessions that we've experienced, it's been a bull market for the gold. 
uh, investment. And I think that that's what we're looking at as a possible scenario to develop. But right now, I think it's all hanging on how the Fed tries to deal with what we're dealing with uh, this inflation and cost of living that's exacerbated at this point and, and, and how they're going to try and manage it at this stage. Coin and jewelry demand is an interesting one in the U.S. And uh, really, I briefly spoke to one of the exhibitors here, and they're, they're seeing uh, meaning uh, investors selling their gold uh, just to cover credit card expenses. Like, have you seen a similar trend in your in your survey when you look at it? Like, yeah. is that something you've been witnessing? Actually, we've got a lot of different market data on bar and coin demand. It tends to be pretty volatile in terms of quarter on quarter. It usually gets a lot of momentum on the back of a catalyst. We saw the invasion in Russia of Russia into the Ukraine drive a lot of money into the uh, coin market in the US. We saw the banking crisis that we experienced draw a lot of money out of banks and into the coin and bar market. And uh, with the uh, Hamas uh, invasion of Israel, we saw the same thing. So you can see these moments where things are spiking. And I think that ultimately, Democratic president has actually led more people to be owned in gold in larger scale ways. But I think at this stage, what we're seeing is a definite slowdown quarter on quarter for first quarter. Expectation is the same for second quarter. Quarter on quarter in the U.S., it's down about 45 percent in terms of the demand that we've seen for bar and coin in the U.S., small bar and coin in the U.S. And I think that that's probably going to be something that we'll expect to see again as well in second quarter when the numbers come in. And it's really just people putting a pause on what they're doing. But with these high prices, it might be time to dig out some of those investments and take advantage of it. So this is where you get this really cool dynamic in the gold market where I've owned these coins for a long time and I'm going to bring them out of the coffers and I'm going to actually put it to work for me right now and take a little bit off the table. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, perspective, actually. It's like I asked somebody else, is like, is gold expensive right now? Right? Like, how, how would you answer that question? Me? I'd say no. I think yeah. actually there's always a good time to get into the gold market. Now, you might be able to look and see if I'm going to buy a dip or I'm going to buy a buoyant moment in the market. But I think at this stage, the case for why gold will continue to be a really significant asset for central banks and investors, whether it's Eastern or Western investors, is very strong. And actually, the surprise that we've had over the last year has been how strong the jewelry market's held up, which speaks a little bit to two factors. One, I think we're still coming out of that post-COVID world or into that post-COVID world in markets like China, where the auspicious nature of jewelry plays a big role. Same in India. But that's actually something that's actually been helpful in terms of the overall demand profile of gold. But I also think that it still forms a, a kind of savings in some of the emerging markets as well. Now, let's see where we come in at second quarter numbers. But at this stage, I'd say to you that bar and coin are probably more price sensitive than maybe investors. So when you're thinking about who can be back to the table when the prices are where they are today, probably central banks and likely to be Western investors when they see rate cuts. Yeah, interesting. Like you mentioned China and consumer demand in China. We had a couple conversations here on the channel about the Chinese investor sort of running out of options, meaning they used to invest for the longest time for decades into real estate. Sure. Right. And that sort of option has disappeared because the real estate market sort of imploded. Well, it's, it's still like, an option. It, it's yeah, a question it's like of whether you want return, to risk it. Exactly. Right. But uh, <laughs> do you really want to invest there? So gold has really become like the number one investment sure. idea for, for, for the Chinese. I'm curious, like what are you seeing uh, uh, coming out of China based on retail and, and demand? Absolutely. If you look at the ETF flows, as a simple example, the, the first thing I'd say is that China's been a standout market. It's $3 billion for the Asian region, of which the largest component of that is made up of Chinese investments. Um, the market has developed over the last 10 years for a healthy investment market domestically. So you can find the ways to own financial instruments, you can take physical delivery out of the Shanghai Gold Exchange. You can make investments in gold. The price is transparent. It's clear. It's easy to access. And people have a very strong understanding of how the market works. Now, at these toppy levels, are they going to slow down a bit? Probably. They'll cool it out a bit. But look, you've highlighted a couple of factors that are in play. Real estate markets not really performing well at all. Equity markets challenging in this environment. And the third component, which a lot of people aren't necessarily putting together just yet, and that's the RMB devaluation. And an ability to get your money out of the country, it's a non-factor. You can't do it. So you look at home and you basically say, I've got a developed strong gold market. I'm going to make the investment and add it to my portfolio. How, how does India compare to China in that regard? I'd say developing 
on the investment front, but probably lagging on the financial instrument side. 14 different ETFs are on offer in India. More people are looking at how to develop the financial markets, but a strong understanding of gold, but a lot more reliance on the physical market and the and the jewelry market to be the way of expressing your interest in owning gold. But look, you've got gold-backed bonds by the government, you've got financial instruments on offer, and more asset management companies looking at how they can turn this into an investment that comes becomes more mainstream. Substitution into silver, is that something that's at play in, China, uh, in, in, in India? Is that something I've been hearing just because the price of gold is so high, they're substituting it with silver now? I think they're two different markets. I'm not really um, seeing people tell us that they're looking more at silver than they are at gold. It's a much smaller market. And actually, there might be some substitution here and there, just in terms of price level or, or people's psycholo- psychology around saying it's a lower price point I can get in. I'd say to you that gold stands out. And actually, what I found most interesting over uh, the recent couple of weeks in terms of some of the survey work that we've done, in particular with investors um, in the U.S., in the financial markets in the U.S., is that the impediments to owning gold are at the lowest level they've ever been. In the past, you would hear them say, oh, I can't own commodities or, or I don't understand how to a- analyze it. All other commodities are on the rise in terms of impediments and the challenges for making that decision. On gold, it's declining impediment in front of them. So basically, they're getting their head around it and they're understanding it. So I'd say to you, it's standing out as something that is slightly different to other commodities and other precious metals. Well, in the US, you can buy it at Costco now. Yeah. Right. Absolutely, so, you can buy what it. Was that Costco. Did, like, what you mentioned, impediment, like barrier to access, like well, look, gold. I, like I think that's a that's a fantastic development for the gold market. And what does it tell us? It tells us that a trusted distributor is basically saying, "I'm going to serve the needs of investors through this channel." And guess what? It's working, and it's actually really exciting to see it. There's small numbers relative to the overall scale of the gold market on a global basis, but it just keeps keeps reconfirming what we know. People want to buy from a trusted source. And they have an interest in adding it to their to their ownership. I mean, I'm still looking for an explanation why gold rose so sharply, like earlier in the year. Like That's speculation. It, was it just speculation? I think a combination like, of the, a couple of factors. There was definitely some speculation yeah. going into it, but then there's definitely that strong demand. Don't underestimate yeah. how important it is to understand that gold's global, right? Yeah. Those demand sources right now, central banks and retail investors in Asia. That's actually been a really strong supporting market. And the other factor, again, people are saying all this negative around ETFs. You haven't seen the big unwind of ETFs that may be on its own in a world where that's the only factor driving gold demand right now. That might have had a bigger price impact, but it hasn't. 110 tons of gold has been absorbed easily into the demand that's been playing out. I'm going out on a limb with the next question because sort of my, my previous question hinted at is like, have you seen Saudi Arabia exchange remember for gold, for example? Because it sort of fit the timeline of the rising gold where all of a sudden like a massive spike in price coincided with a bit of a, an oil trade, for example, between China and Saudi Arabia. I'm curious if you've seen anything like that. No, I haven't seen okay. anything to that nature. I haven't huh? seen anything around the barter trade. But what I would say to you is that gold actually can be used um, pretty readily in, in the form of, of um, reserves, as we've seen. It can be used pretty commonly amongst counterparts. Um, but the key element, and it's something that I highlighted on the panel that I was just a part of, is that we've got to maintain a single gold market to in order to achieve that global level of liquidity and that trusted price level that we can actually talk to. So it's important for um, none of these markets to kind of break off and do their own thing. Curveball question, maybe, but how much uh, like part of the World Gold Council is like Chinese or uh, Indian, for example? In terms of like staff? Partic- staff, participantship, like membership as well, like because you say it's global. So I'm sure. sure is like, are you just representing Western companies? No, like, no, no. So no, I'm curious, got, like, if you could. Got, uh, we've got Chinese members. I think we've got four Chinese members. I think we've got members from Africa. We've got members from Europe. We've got members from Canada, the US, and Australia. Yeah. So it's quite. So it's a yeah. diverse it's a global group of, thing. Uh, okay. of, of global. And we've got staff globally too. So we've got offices in Shanghai, Beijing, Singapore. Um, we've just opened an office in Dubai. We've got an office in London and a lot, an office in New York. So we're everywhere we need to be, uh, except Australia. <laughs> no one's been able to convince us. It's too far. Or, or to it's too far away. CEO to put an office in Australia yet. <laughs> no, interesting. Um, the report also mentions like 
the gold market is la- lacking a catalyst or in search of a catalyst to, to, to drive it forward. The question is like, do we really need one? Do we already have it? Like, what kind of catalyst are we looking for? I like, think when what we could say, it be? I think when we're talking about the catalyst that we need is we need to see a shift in certain stuck behaviors. And I, I think that it really resonates well when you read the report that, that for those Western investors to come back to the table, something's got to change. Huh. Something's got to move. Something's got to happen. And right now, again, if you're stuck where rates are and they're holding firm and we're kind of flatlining for the rest of the year, is that more of, uh, you know, you know, more of the same or is that something where investors are just going to sit tight for now? And I think that's that's what we're talking to is the fact that there needs to be something happening and there needs to be some form of clarity around the landscape forward, which will either give gold that move up, question the dollar strength or actually put at risk risk assets like equities. Right now, we're, we're kind of treading water, right? And I think that that's what we're talking to when we say we need a catalyst. Yeah. It could be something as simple as clarity around the election in the U.S. or what we're seeing in Europe, right? Is yeah. that the catalyst right now? A little bit of political uncertainty in France and actually a 25 basis point move. That's yeah. actually been a big impact to the investor sentiment in Europe. Yeah. Two billion has moved in already. And it's well, been over the course of two months. What is interesting, a good friend of mine is, or one of my best friends is actually a teacher in the U.S. And we were talking about, we were hanging out the other day and we we're talking about the U.S. debt situation. He's like, hey, you're completely out to lunch. Like, we, we don't care. Like, who, who's going to call us on our debt? All right. Like, we, we own 80% of our debt is internally owned domestically. Like, we were never going to call our debt. We're fine. Don't worry about it. All so, right? like, sort of like, the, so my, my point is the mentality, the think, like when you're looking at the ETF buying and the inflows and the overall maybe generalist demand and goal, is, is that something you see? Is like, well, we're immune to all this, uh, what, what's no. happening in the market. Like, is that maybe the thinking to, to narrow minded maybe? Or narrow minded is maybe the wrong word. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw anybody under the bus. But mm-hmm. like, is that maybe to, to US optimistic. focused? Optimistic maybe? Is like, hey, we're untouchable? I think so. I, I, and what I'd say is that if you think and, and you check the survey that we've put out and you read in the detail of what central banks are really telling us, what they're really telling us is that they're concerned about it. So the question is, what does it mean for those assets and their performance if these global investors step away from the U.S. market? And yeah, there's a lot of large level of that that's consumed internally in the U.S., et cetera. But it's, it all puts it all into question. And, and I think that that's where you have concerns. If a China steps away or a Japan steps away or, or whomever steps away from owning these assets, what's it going to mean and how's it going to look? And, and ultimately, the high rate environment impacts the U.S. at the, at the sovereign debt level. But the high rate environment also impacts bonds more generally and actually credit risk more generally. And I think that that's something that's been on our mind quite a bit. Are we looking at, and I think it was brought up today at the conference, but is there a banking crisis developing? Are there risks around credit events that are going to develop around bond markets? I personally look at the privates market and I say to myself, you know what? That's a lot of question <laughs> as to how that's going to develop and how it's going to play. And we know that there's been a lot of people chasing those trades. Right, there's high yields on on private markets, and just keep an eye on the space. It's risky. So, so Joe, is like we looked extensively at the first half of the year. Let, let, let's look forward a little bit. To, uh, sure. uh, second half of the year, lot, lots of events, you know, on the horizon. U.S. election is probably the biggest one uh, the market looks forward to, or sure. I'm not sure if they're looks forward to, but uh, the market is, you know, lo- keep us looking entertained. at <laughs> exactly looking at. But uh, what does your uh, you know report say? Like, what do you expect for gold in the next six yeah, months? I, here, we we expect that that rate cut will come in the second half of the year. It'll come in the U.S. and actually that'll actually be probably the most simple and probably the most pronounced factor that'll actually impact the Western investor sentiment. And I think that that's probably the biggest catalyst that we expect to see on the horizon. When you start looking at other catalysts, like the outcome of the election, the outcome of different political issues that are developing more globally, those take time to develop. You'll have a reaction to the election outcome, but then you have to see how policies start to develop. So there'll be a little bit more of a longer term trajectory before they start weighing in on the gold price and the gold investor sentiment. Now, look, things move faster than they've ever moved before, so people might be able to assess that quickly. And we know both candidates as they stand today, as we speak, um, we've seen their playbooks. And so we have a pretty good idea of how their policies might develop. So it might happen a little bit quicker. But okay. like, I, I got to jump in here. It's like, Joe, it's like, get into your head, like, which candidate is better for the gold price? 
Oh, without better getting for the political, gold price? Like, I don't care about the political side, but who, who would be better for the gold price? Well, I think what you'd find is that there's a community of investors that would simply say, if there's a Democratic win, then we're going to go back to putting gold into our coffers because the tax and spend environment is actually one that's going to be a concern for them. So that would actually bring that level of investment back. But on the flip side, if a Republican wins, it'll be all about strengthening the dollar and bringing things home. What's that going to mean? Are we really going to be able to get out of this inflationary environment? And is that going to be something that's going to actually be good for gold? Mm. Possibly. Yeah, it could be. So I think both will have benefits that they could bring to the gold market in terms of the outcome from the election. But I also think that we have to keep in mind how the policies will develop. And that's what we don't know. So we know what the playbooks have been in the past, but I don't know if we have a clear picture of exactly how they're going to develop in the future. And the geopolitical risks that come along with uh, uh, a Republican win could be pretty high, in particular at China risks. I'd like to see how that develops over time. Any, any other catalysts you're looking for like in the second half of the year, anything that we should be paying attention to? I think, again, it's about monetary policy more broadly on a global scale. I, I really am intrigued by the fact that the ECB cut has done what it's done for the for the investor flows mm-hmm. on the short term. I'd like to see how that plays out a little yeah. bit more. And those are the factors that are on my mind. Yeah, it's interesting. It's almost mind blowing how you can like contribute $2 billion of flows into ETFs to a 25 basis point cut. Well, it, these, these, are, these yeah. are investors that are speaking to us. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Like, I uh, didn't expect that to um, immediately show show an effect, right? Um, I have one last question for you, and uh, like I just warned you b- briefly before it, but uh, like the World Gold Council, and we've seen comments about it. Like, do you see the World Gold Council ever emerge into a role where it could be like an OPEC, where it starts controlling the you know the supply, actually, meaning the world gold production does? Like, is that uh, I know it's a far flung question here, but I'm curious if that's no, the, even the, if the answer is does make sense. The answer is no. We have a very robust governance structure where members are informed and in understanding our business strategy, and our business strategy is run by the organization, and it's actually focusing on market development. Mm. Uh, most of uh, the member firms that we have are intent on bringing out as much production as possible. Mm. I can't think of any that don't want to do mm. that. <laughs> Um, and what I would say to you is that we're focusing on increasing consumption and demand. And that's where our energy and our resources are spent. So as long as we continue to be successful with that, then we have no reason for our member firms to hold back production or, or even think that way like OPEC might. I think the other thing that I'd highlight is aspirationally, we can see a world where the LBMA, the World Gold Council, and other organizations work more harmoniously to actually continue to do market development to increase trust, transparency, and overall consumption of gold. And that's where we're spending our time and energy. We're looking at areas in the market, for example, artisanal mining, where we've sanctioned a report to be written uh, by Dominic Robb. And actually, the idea there is to simply say, either you're with the mining market and actually coming to the market with transparency and and actually we are understanding how that market is working. Mm. Otherwise, we're going to basically warn people against it and say, don't deal in that side of the market. And we're working with central banks similarly to say, how can we bring those corners of the market into the light and bring trust and transparency to those as well? So again, it's all about demand. It's not about supply and demand working uh, with uh, the members to kind of try and figure out what the balance is there. It's about just saying, what can we do to increase trust? What can we do to increase transparency and actually overall demand for things? And that's why I think we'll always be kind of at the front end of the market, talking to people around, understanding the flows and understanding what the impediments are and removing those impediments. Would you say the artisanal market is, is sort of to blame for the negative image mining has and gold mining has? Say that again? Would you would you agree with the statement that the artisanal mining segment of the market is sort of to blame for the negative image mining has? It, it gets an element, I think, that yeah. can play. I think what the problem with artisanal mining is that there's a lot of mining that takes place that's actually because it needs to mm-hmm. and people want. Yeah. They, they, they see an opportunity to get it done. Uh, I think what we lack is the transparency that we need to feel good about the fact that all mining, whether it's artisanal or junior or mainstream, is actually being done to a level of standard where it's safe, it's healthy, it's not but that involving. comes at a cost. It does. It does come right. at a cost. But but there are projects that we've got underway, mm-hmm. like our London Principles. Please, please, please elaborate. Bank. I find that yeah. interesting. Yeah. Like what we've just released with our London Principles, where we're going to central banks mm-hmm. using a model that's been successfully implemented in markets like the Philippines, mm-hmm. where if we could get artisanal miners to adhere to a certain level of behavior, practices, and protocols, 
that the central bank will be a ready-made offtake for them at fair mm-hmm. and reasonable prices. Uh, and in some instances, maybe even premiums. And that's actually a model that four central banks have signed on to. Now we have another eight that are in the works to talk about becoming part of these London principles. Simply saying, if you set up your mining, you adhere to these standards, we'll move promptly and quickly to be the offtake for that goal. Because you now are marrying up demand from a central bank that's looking at a reserve portfolio saying I could add it, and uh, a need in a local community. Now the key is finding out and weeding out the nefarious types that can be involved in these types of things, whether they're an offtake for the gold, or they're upstream in terms of sourcing the gold because they know it's actually a way of getting after the money. So we're digging in on the data. We're looking at a report that we're going to be basically uh, publishing with Dom de Grob, and we're ultimately going to be looking at how we can help the community come online. But I think to your point around it being a negative image for the industry, I think it, it's it's weighed in as, a, as an element of that as well. Yeah, no, sad, sad but true. I, I think. Um, very last question. The gold price is going to be range bound for the rest of the year? I think that until you see that catalyst, I'm going to tell you that my personal view is until we see something along the rates movement, uh, we'll probably be range bound. Fantastic. Joe, what a wonderful conversation. I'm surprised we haven't done this sooner. It was well, fantastic. It's been great to be here. Really appreciate it. And thanks for the time. Like, where, where can we find more of your resources? Pretty straightforward. You can find all of our information on gold.org. And within there, you'll find Gold Hub, which is where we have all the financial market data all the research, all the information in the survey results that we actually have published, again, on central banks, with retail consumers, mm-hmm. et cetera. So it's a lot of information ready to be ready to be consumed mm-hmm. by people. And so you said there's a new Idris Elba movie or documentary coming out? There's more coming, more on, coming. On, on the golden journey. So no, I won't fantastic. spoil anything, uh, but uh, <laughs> I can rest assured, I can, give you, I can give you a confirmation that John Reed and I are not featured in that. <laughs> we are featured, however, in Unearth, our podcast. So I'm shamelessly plugging <laughs> it right we'll, now. <laughs> we'll link down to that down below as well. Absolutely. We, we appreciate that. And we're having a lot of fun with that. And actually, we're doing something similar, which is basically trying to give people insights that they might not get from just reading a report. Yeah. Well, you, I think your reports are fantastic, by the way. It's like there, there's good data in it. It's neutral. Absolutely. Like it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a good source for me as well, like when we prepare for these conversations. Great. Uh, fantastic. Joe, thank you so much for your time. Thank Everybody you. else, thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially from the Rural Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. If you have any questions, please put them down below. Uh, comments, likes, subscribe to the channel. It's hugely appreciated. We go through a lot of effort to make this happen and uh, anything that you can show us in return would be highly appreciated. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here from Florida. Thank you so much. <laughs>